In this video, we will discuss the urbanization of America during the Gilded Age. The United States is becoming increasingly urban, thanks in part to a large wave of immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. Major cities grow too quickly, causing a number of problems that will be addressed during the Progressive Era after the turn of the century. The population of the United States grew drastically in the second half of the 19th century. As you can see in the graph on the right, the population tripled in 50 years, growing from 23.2 million in 1850 to 76 million by 1900. One reason the population grew during the Gilded Age was the increase in the overall life expectancy of Americans. In 1870, the average life expectancy of an American was 39.4 years. By 1900, that number had risen to 48.2. Another reason for the increase in population and rise was immigration. As you can see from the graph on the left, immigration rates went up between 1861 and 1900, with the 1880s contributing the largest number of immigrants. The movement of populations from rural to urban areas is called urbanization. Urbanization in the United States increased gradually in the early 1800s, then accelerated in the years after the Civil War. By 1890, 28% of Americans lived in urban areas. And by 1920, more Americans lived in towns and cities than in rural areas. 11 million Americans migrated from the countryside to cities in the 50 years between 1870 and 1920. During these same years, an additional 25 million immigrants, mostly from Europe, moved to the United States, one of the largest mass migrations in human history. And while some settled on farms, most moved into the nation's growing towns and cities. As you can see from the graph on the left, the populations of four major cities rose between 1860 and 1900, especially New York City, whose population rose to almost 3.5 million by the turn of the century. On the right, you can see the U.S. was primarily a rural nation until 1920, when the urban population outnumbered Americans living on farms and in rural areas. The negative forces driving Europeans to emigrate in the late 19th century included, number one, the poverty of displaced farm workers driven from the land by the mechanization of farm work. More machines means less jobs. Number two, overcrowding and joblessness in European cities as a result of a population boom. Number three, religious persecution, such as that of the Jewish pogroms in Russia. A pogrom is an organized massacre of helpless people, in this case, the Jews. The positive reasons for choosing to emigrate to the United States were, number one, economic opportunities afforded by the settling of the Great Plains and the abundance of industrial jobs in the U.S. cities. Number two, another reason is this country's reputation for political and religious freedom. Number three, the introduction of large steamships and relatively inexpensive one-way passage in these ships made it possible for millions of poor Europeans to emigrate. Most immigrant groups that had formerly come to America by choice seemed distinct, but in fact had many similarities. Most had come from Northern and Western Europe. Most had some experience with representative democracy. With the exception of the Irish, most were Protestant. Many were literate, and some possessed a fair degree of wealth. The new groups arriving by the boatload in the Gilded Age were characterized by few of these traits. Their nationalities included Greek, Italian, Polish, Slovak, Serb, Russian, Croat, and others. Until cut off by federal decree, Japanese and Chinese settlers relocated to the American West Coast. None of these groups were predominantly Protestant. The mass, vast majority were Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. However, due to increased persecution of Jews in Eastern Europe, many Jewish immigrants sought freedom from torment. Very few newcomers spoke any English, and large numbers were illiterate in their native tongues. None of these groups hailed from de democratic regimes. The American form of government was as foreign as its culture. When they arrived in America, they landed at the primary immigration station, Ellis Island. Immigrants were tagged with information from their ship's registry, then waited in long lines for medical and legal inspections to determine if they were fit for entry into the U.S. Most of them passed through successfully in hours, while others were detained for days or weeks. The ones that made it through mostly stayed in New York, while others traveled all over the country. This graph clearly illustrates the origins of European immigrants from 1870 to 1920. Between 1870 and 1890, most of the immigrants came from Northwestern Europe. They were Protestant, literate, skilled, and middle class. They assimilated easily into American life. Starting in 1900, most of the immigrants that came to the U.S. were from Southern and Eastern Europe. They were either Catholics or Jews, unskilled and poor. Forty percent returned home as birds of passage, taking the money they earned in American factories back to their homeland to purchase land. 
This graph illustrates the waves of immigration from the Civil War until the end of the 20th century. As you can see, the Panic of 1873 caused a severe drop in immigration, largely because there were no economic opportunities for immigrants. The next spike of immigration happens with the anti-Jewish pogroms in Europe, which pushed thousands of Jews to emigrate to the U.S. to escape the violence. Once again, immigration drops with the Panic of 1893, but will drastically increase after the turn of the 20th century. This will continue until the outbreak of World War I. The immigration of the Gilded Age had dramatic effects on the United States. One of the biggest side effects of immigration was the overcrowding of cities due to urbanization. Cities grew too quickly, leading to a number of problems that city governments were ill-equipped to handle. Tenements were overcrowded, which contributed to poverty and the creation of ethnic ghettos and tenement districts. These districts became riddled with crime, disease, drugs, and pollution. Overcrowding also contributed to the increased demand for city and social services, such as schools, police, fire departments, sanitation services, and transportation, which most cities had trouble offering. To create these services, cities had to increase taxes and relied primarily on political corruption to get many of these projects completed. Finally, most of these immigrants, because of their ethnic backgrounds, were very slow to assimilate. Their culture was so drastically different from mainstream American culture that they resisted assimilation. It would be their children that would Americanize and join mainstream culture largely thanks to public school education. Another side effect of this wave of immigration was the increase in nativism, or anti-immigrant sentiment, of the Gilded Age. Several groups contributed to these nativist ideas. First was labor. Labor unions were solidly against immigration because of its impact on the worker. Factory owners throughout the Gilded Age hired different immigrant groups to work side by side in an effort to try and keep them from organizing. Using the language barrier, they hoped that immigrants, who were also willing to work for less than native-born Americans, they tried to keep unions out of their factories. The next group were social Darwinists, who believed that these new immigrants were ruining the culture of the United States. They believed in the racial superiority of the Anglo-Saxon American, along with the old immigrant groups, who wanted to keep their American culture pure. These nativist views pressured the U.S. government to begin immigration restrictions, beginning with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned the immigration of Chinese laborers into the U.S. Many Chinese worked on the Transcontinental Railroad and lived on the West Coast. The federal government also launched the Dillingham Commission, which studied the impact of immigration on the U.S. Its findings concluded that immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe posed a serious threat to American society and culture and should be greatly reduced in the future. The federal government responded by prohibiting immigrants with disease, criminal records, prostitution, and anarchists from entering the U.S. Another group contributing to these nativist fears was the Immigration Restriction League, which pushed for the use of literacy tests to restrict foreign immigration. Here you can see some cartoons that are for and against immigration during the Gilded Age. On the bottom left, you see an immigrant coming off the boat. Robber barons are stopping him because he's poor, uneducated, and dresses differently. If you look at the shadows behind the robber barons, you'll see that they were once like the immigrant. On the top left, you see the cartoon titled The American River Ganges. The alligators coming out of the water are actually Catholic bishops, provoking the fear of the effect of Catholicism on America. You can see that the public school in the background is in ruins, showing that the immigrant children are ruining American public schools. On the right, you see a cartoon with a favorable view of immigrants. The title is Welcome to All. It portrays Uncle Sam standing in front of an ark with his arms wide open to immigrants who are lined up in front of the ark. He is willing to bring them into America. In the 18th and 19th centuries, cities had generally grown up haphazardly with little central planning. By the mid-19th century, reformers called for a more ordered vision of the city. Among the most important innovations were the great urban parks, which reflected the desire to provide an antidote to the congestion of the city landscape. Parks would allow city residents a healthy, restorative escape from the strains of urban life by reacquainting them with the natural world. The most successful of these landscape designers was Frederick Law Olmsted. He helped design Central Park in New York. Central Park was such a success that he was asked to help design parks in other cities. In Chicago, Daniel Burnham transformed urban planning. His elaborate system of parks left an overall plan for the entire city. Many of the immigrants who came to America in the Gilded Age had very little money. They were forced to stay in New York City and often moved to the tenement buildings in the ethnic ghettos. 
A tenement was an overcrowded or unsanitary multifamily urban dwelling or apartment building. Most tenement buildings had four apartments per floor with no bathrooms or running water. Most tenements had outhouses in the back or families would use chamber pots. Each apartment usually had three rooms. One room was the parlor or living room, the room for the family which also doubled as a bedroom for the parents, the kitchen with a stove as well as a bathtub for bathing, and finally a bedroom for the kids with one bed that usually took up the entire room. Families had to get water from the well downstairs and bring it up each day. Jacob Reese was a reporter for the New York Sun. He shocked middle-class Americans in 1890 with his book, How the Other Half Lives. His account was a damning indictment of the dirt, disease, vice, and misery of the New York City slums. The book will deeply influence a future New York City commissioner, Theodore Roosevelt. Most of the people who lived in tenements were immigrants.